Um, hello, everybody. Welcome to the session Frictionless Data for More Collaboration with Open Data Editor. Um, before we deep dive, let's just introduce ourselves very quickly. I'm Sara Petti. I'm the International Network Lead, uh, Projects and Community Lead at Open Knowledge Foundation. And here's my colleague, Patricio. Hi, everyone. Patricio Del Boca. I'm currently the tech leader of the Open Knowledge Foundation. I'm also like an open activist since like young age. And here are some ways that you can contact us via email, X, or GitHub as well. So uh, before we start, we just wanted to give you a short introduction about Open Knowledge Foundation for those of you who might not know us. Um, Open Knowledge Foundation is a nonprofit organization, and our mission is to create a fair, sustainable, and open future um, for all, advancing open knowledge as a design principle. What we actually do uh, at Open Knowledge, we're one of the pioneers organization when it comes to open data. And basically what we do is building open source tools that people can use um, to uh, basically uh, share data in a more fair way. Uh, and of course, because all those tools are developed in an open source way, uh, we also build the community that's come around those open source tools uh, as contributors and users. And because we believe as um, that people should have skills and that we want to empower individuals, we do training as well, uh, with the idea to really uh, unlock information, to create uh, knowledge, uh, to produce positive social change. At Open Knowledge Foundation, we are very specific about what we mean by open. Um, we publish the open definition, which is largely um, uh, built on top of the open source definition that defines what an op open data and an open content is. And you can see the definition there. And we also take data publication very, very seriously. And we are the ones behind Seekan, which is an open source data management system that is powering data hubs and open data portals for government and public administration and organization around the world. Um, but enough about what we do. Uh, what we wanted to talk about today is data friction. So because we have decades of experience around data publication and data portability, basically we can say that we have quite an expertise also when it comes to data friction. So we wanted to maybe pause a little bit with you and try to see what the main data friction out there are. So first of all, when you have a data set uh, that you find, uh, the first thing that the first data friction that you might encounter is if the data has no license, then can you use it? Can you not use it? This is very unclear. I was having a conversation actually yesterday with someone that told me by default, if you don't put a license, then basically the data set is copyrighted. So in case you want to publish it open, this is definitely something that you have to pay attention to because that means that your data set otherwise is by default copyrighted. If I then open the data set and there is basically no metadata, it means as well that I don't know exactly what the data mean. So who created the data? Who is the author? Who owns it? Um, what do column names mean? What kind of value I must expect in this cell? Um, these are all things that make you lose a lot, a lot of time, especially if you want to do analysis on top. This is what will take maybe more, even more time than what the analysis will take. Another friction is if you don't use standards in your data sets, that means that basically when you want to combine them, um, this is very, very hard to do and that you have to kind of like put them all in the same format. Uh, at Open Knowledge Foundation, we do have standards as well, so we definitely encourage you to use open standards. Uh, but any standard is actually good. Um, another thing is then if you save your data set in a proprietary format, it means that people that do, don't have, do not have that proprietary license might not be able to use uh, those data sets. And that's kind of like very important because licenses can be quite expensive, actually. And then, of course, um, there is the problem of archiving data. And if you don't archive it properly, then it becomes very, very difficult to find it. Even for yourself, if you're looking for your own data set, it might be very hard to find it. So thinking about all those data friction, basically at Open Knowledge Foundation, 15 years ago, more or less, we came up with this toolkit called Frictionless Data. Thank you, Sara. Um, the main problem to solve here is like when all these frictions appear, the situation no longer is, oh, I'm going to give you this CSV file or I'm going to share this file to share data. In order, to be, able, in order to, be able, to be able to share your data with your license, with the information, with the data data, then you no longer need to share one file. You need to share the file plus the license plus another file in another format that specifies which columns it has, what is the description. So to fix anything of each one of all the frictionless that Sarah mentioned, we need extra information. And how we package that 
and into one single thing that people can share with each other is a problem, it's a technical problem. And then that is why we came with this idea of data package. Um, data package is basically a way to share the data file with a descriptor. Like, it's, it's like the descriptor that contains the metadata plus the schema. So you share not only the data, so the CSV file, but also you, you share a file that contains information on how to read that, um, that, CSV, com uh, that CSV file. Um, and once you have like this way of packaging your data, so you don't only share the data itself, but also all the metadata in a standardized way, then you can have like a, a lot of communities and software tools and data metadata standards that allows people to create an ecosystem um, around it. So people uh, that wants to read a CSV file no longer says, like, okay, okay, I'm gonna open it with Excel or I'm gonna open it with Python or R in a raw way, but Instead of reading the CSV file, I read the data package. And when I read the data package, all the information con in the metadata and in the schema automatically starts shaping like the way the application loads the data. So when it loads the data, it loads as the way that you as person that is sharing the data expects you to, the other person to have. So to keep it like in a simple example, when you in an Excel share a data, uh, share an Excel file and the date column how many times people struggle because the Excel do whatever it wants with the date column and changes into an integer or change the format. Well, by sharing with your data a descriptor, which is like a file with metadata, the, the application can automatically say, okay, now this column is a, is a date and it has like this format, so I'm gonna load it in a correct way. So that's the idea behind um, frictionless data and before um, behind data package, to have one way to share both the data and the metadata. Um, maybe just to give you a few examples from like community uh, projects that were made on, on top of frictionless to make you understand also how frictionless can solve some of these problems. Uh, one that I wanted to mention is uh, Libraries Hacked. Uh, that's um, in in a UK initiative um, that basically is collecting data on libraries in the UK. So the situation they found themselves um, with was a situation in which not so much data was shared. There was no standard, no guidelines on the data that had to be collected on libraries. So basically the library professionals came together and they said, okay, let's maybe start with some simple unified data sets for the whole UK and let's see how we can make it work. And the interesting thing, it was very, very easy to um, kind of like select to understand what kind of topics people wanted data on. So for example, events happening at the library, at what time um, the library was opening and closing, um, you know, for mobile libraries, for example, what the stops were, that was kind of easy. But then when it came to describing the data, that it was also very easy to fail in the sense that, so there was this data set that was started for closing times and then there was no standard for it and no kind of like schema, so no description of how the data had to be entered. And so of course you find yourself with dates entered in all kinds of different formats, which means that then someone has to go after and sort of like clean it and make it all look in the same way. And so in that sense, Adding a descriptor for them, in, in this specific case, uh, table schema, which is one of the uh, frictionless standards, helped them because then basically like people knew how they had to enter that particular information in the data set. So this is kind of like on the range of like the medium low skills when it comes to technical technicalities. Um, but we also have an example for a more mid technical community, which some makes me a little, thi little bit thinking about um, Wikidata as well, um, which is Bicodemo. Um, it's an oceanography repository with which you, we worked. And uh, what they had is this very big you know, um, repository where people doing research in oceanography, um, you know, maritime biology and all of that, you can think linked to ocean sciences, um, were putting the data. And what you can imagine is that you find yourself, people were uploading their data, maybe not in a standardized way, maybe not checking very much what they were putting inside. And so the curation team was actually spending a lot of time going 
after all the entries, checking, going back to people, saying, okay, we are missing something here, you have to adjust this thing, there is an error there. Um, and so what we did with them was integrating in the repository, uh, building a kind of like application that was um, kind of like invisible for the users. So when the user would upload their data, uh, frictionless uh, behind the scenes would kind of like run a validation on the data sets and directly say to people, be careful, there's an error here, you cannot upload. And so it would generate also um, an error report and which would indicate to people what the errors are. And on top of that, it would also record all the cleaning that people were doing. And so that, of course, enhances the reproducibility and the fairness of the data set because someone coming after can understand what happened in between the raw data and the clean data that is entered in the repository. Um, but of course, those two examples are and frictionless itself was thought for communities that have skills, let's say, ranging from medium to high technical skills. And so what we basically started to think about a couple of years ago is how can we make, you know, there's a lot of like data producers that are not technical. They don't have the technical skills. And how can we kind of like enlarge the frictionless experience for them as well. And how can we make them, uh, how can we make them use frictionless without having to learn how to code? And this is how we started thinking about Open Data Editor. So Open Data Editor is basically this easy to use desktop application. The idea is really to maximize frictionless and make it available for people that don't have the technical expertise. Um, it allows people to do data management with no code, and it's really optimized for non-technical people. And when we were actually designing and thinking about this, our first conversations were actually with Wikimedia community in Latin America, specifically in, in Buenos Aires. But um, enough of talking, let us maybe show you how Open Data Editor looks like. Thank you, Sarah. And two things before I start. First, supposedly this one was going to be like an interactive demo, but because of like the displays, I'm gonna need to do a screenshots and explain the screenshots. And the second one is that at four o'clock I have another panel. So after explaining like the technical parts of the application, I'm gonna need to like sneak out of the room and leave you with my lovely coworker here. Um, but yeah, I apologize in advance because it's gonna be a little bit rude to, to, to leave the window, the, the, the room. Okay, so. Um, open Data Editor, as Sarah mentioned, and we are thinking, um, Frictionless is a cool concept. It's basically like a docker for data, um, but it's difficult to explain and it's difficult to implement. And we want to reach to audiences that do not have technical skills. And, and I'm thinking, and I always put like the same example. Back in Argentina, I work uh, with a local legislative power. They created like a small open data portal and they wanted to publish data on it. But the way they created the data set and the CSV file to publish was manually. So after like each sessions, like one of the person in the department will collect all the data, will add a row to the CSV file, and then it will publish it to, to the internet. And in that manual process of collecting, creating the CSV and uploading, a lot of errors are, uh, appear. And they wanted to say, hey, I, I want to ensure that the data set that I am uploading to the website has quality. So that I don't mess around with the CSV, that I don't forget any data. So I, I need some kind of quality validation in between my manual process and my publication. And that's why, uh, that's what Open Data Editor is trying to like cover. That is a, a scenario of people that do not have coding skill that is difficult for them to understand what is a standard, what is a schema, what is like a, an integer. Um, I don't, those concepts are difficult to translate. And that's why are we trying to develop like an application. Um, and the application at, at, at the beginning, like it, it tries to open with a really concise message to the user of what this application does. Because we cannot put like, oh, this application is to create a data package to, to publish data without friction, because they are not going to understand what I'm saying. So we are all the time needing to translate like super technical language into like um, text for the users uh, to understand what it's doing. Um, so. Yeah, for example, here we say like the open data editor helps data practitioners with node coding skills to explore tabular data and detect errors in an easier way. Advanced users can also edit metadata and publish their work. Um, so it's kind of like a welcoming screen to the users to kind of explain in, in low level uh, what it's going to do. And what's the idea of the application? The idea is that when I open a CSV file with it, 
that has an error, automatically, like the application flags, okay, here, here is an error. In this case, it's a small CSV that is malformed, um, that in the last row is miss a column. So initially, she, uh, the user has like three red flags over there saying, okay, this file is incorrect. Here is like a warning or where in the data is incorrect. And on the top is like a summary of how many errors. There is a button on the top that is called report. Um, that is the user click on the report. Uh, it appears like what is wrong with the data in a plain language. And it says like this row has less values compared to the other row, the first row in the data source. A key concept is all the rows in tabular must have the same number of columns. So we are not only trying to explain what the error is, but also to like educate the user in good practices and, and in this text at the same time, like learn, uh, yeah, teach to the user, okay, this is a tabular data, this is what is expected. So we are trying to create like really educational texts uh, for people. Um, and then below it says, okay, the row at position number 10, we have like an indicator 10, uh, has a missing cell in field annual at position number three. Um, but when we run like the first experiments with the first users, like even the concept of cell is a little bit complicated for some users. I mean, they are used to Excel, so maybe it's not the most like uh, problematic term, but even like these small um, concepts are complicated. Okay, so when the user uploads like a CSV, a frictionless data detect, okay, this is an error, there is a problem here. The user can just like edit it manually here in the application. Um, and then when it edits it and it has form, like all the errors disappear. Now it says on the top, the data is valid. Um, and over there as well, they change, um, change to green. Which is also like funny because this button of valid created like a huge um, confusion in the community. When we run the pilot, people, okay, what do you mean with valid? And we ran a survey with a lot of users saying, what do you understand for valid? And the amount of answers that we received was like overwhelming and on completely opposite directions of what we were trying to say valid in the technical uh, language uh, of, the, of, the, of the frictionless framework. So another example, because we are talking that frictionless also has like a file that allows you to describe the schema and the metadata of the data. What do we mean with this? So, Let's say, for example, that the person that works in this institution in Cordoba wants to publish a list of the departments of the government with the email. Um, and they create a CSV file that says, okay, the name of the department plus the contact email. So if the user clicks on metadata, uh, which is probably a term that we are going to need to change because it's confusing for end users, and go to schema and fields, it appears like, okay, what are all the columns? Of the data set and here is like okay the department column is one the contact column is another one and we detected it to string which is string is text in technical language um, but we can say to the user hey no this contact is not a, just a string it's an email so because we have a schema because we have metadata and a descriptor and a way to describe how the data should look like we can easily say to the user okay this is a string but this is a string of a type email um, then we can put like another things like URL, like binary, UUID that are more technical, but we can say, okay, this is an email. When we put that this is an email, automatically frictionless runs a validation. Hey, watch out. The value does not match the schema type and format of this field. So in the cell row number three, uh, the type is a string email. So it detects that this cell is expecting an email address, but instead of that, I have like an incomplete e email address. So the user can have the error. If it enters like a correct e email address, then it validates and says, okay, everything is okay. So imagine like a person that is building a data set with their hands can go to the Excel, add new values, come back to the data editor, run a validation, yes, it's okay. Or no, you have a problem. Oh, thank you, I have a problem. So it's kind of like a checker, like a validation. And the thing that we are like most excited about it, uh, about is not only like the validation, but the, here at the end, there is like a publish button. And the publish button is to, okay, this data set is finished, is valid. And now that it's valid, I want to publish it somewhere. Um, 
Nowadays, we can publish it to Zcan, which is like the, data, the open data portal framework that we design. We can publish it to GitHub. We can publish it to Zenodo. And one of the reasons of why we are coming to Wikimedia is to start talking with like, the technical community of Wikimedia, because I want here an option to say publish to Wikidata. Um, so once we have like, all the field to say, OK, I can publish it to Wikidata directly. Um, and in this case, uh, well, if I publish it to GitHub, it, it, as an example, it creates like a repository in GitHub with a couple of files um, in which like, one is the file, which is like the email, the email CSV file. And the other file is data package JSON, which is th this data package JSON has all the information that the user configured in this, in this screen. So in that little file, the next time that someone with Open Data Editor or with a frictionless application opens, it already knows, ah, OK, the second column is not a string, but it's a string of type, type email. And it can create more like a reproducible workflow uh, with it. So that's like in a nutshell the application. Uh, I was trying, I was going to do some more interactive things, but well, because I can have the computer, uh, it's okay. Um, do you want to continue Sarah, on this one, or should I? Oh, thanks. Yeah. So um, what we didn't mention maybe before is that Open Data Editor is currently in its beta phase. So it has been beta released uh, at the end of last year. And we are now working uh, basically towards a V1 release that is happening in December this year. So the draft release will happen in September, so very soon. So we're very excited about it. Uh, and this will serve us basically to start really testing it with the community extensively. Um, what we're going to do is basically we're going to pilot the tool with some journalistic communities that we identified. Um, and we really want them to sort of like start using the tool in the, in the data workflow, really integrating it so that over like a longer lapse of time, I would say, they can really tell us like what worked for them, what didn't work for them, and really give us like precious feedback for of, over a long, long use. But what we also want to do is uh, running some shorter user testing. So basically with people uh, in October, we would like, and if you're interested in participating, actually, let us know. Uh, there's a small pot of money as well. I mean, it's like a token uh, that is available. But basically, we want to see with people from different, um, maybe from different backgrounds and different kind of like usage of data, how they would um, how they would find basically Open Data Editor. And then, as I mentioned, in December, uh, we will release the version one. And this is all um, <laughs> possible thanks to the generous support of the McGovern Foundation. Um, what we also wanted maybe to discuss with you is some main takeaways from developing this application. So one of the things that we started thinking early on is how can we it has been. Uh, it has not been a very straightforward um, journey developing Open Data Editor, and it never is a very straightforward journey to develop an application or any technical product. Um, but somehow, the kind of like pitfalls and mistakes that people do on the road are not very shared very openly uh, often. So one of the things that we really wanted to do with Open Data Editor is sharing openly with the community, like what happened for us, what went wrong, what, you know, I mean, was a little detour uh, for us, uh, and all the interesting things that we found out. And so Patricia was talking a little bit before during the demonstration, let's call it still like this, um, about the language problem that we encounter. So um, one thing that maybe it's worth mentioning is at Open Knowledge Foundation, so we have decades of experience with data publication and data portability and all of that, but the audiences we deal with are always technical audiences. So in a way, um, for us, maybe the tricky part was not identifying our audience immediately, or at least. We started having conversation with people from the glam sector. I mentioned the Wikimedia community also in Argentina, for example. But then, and this was not done intentionally, um, we went back to our technical community and we kind of like iterated with them how we were developing the application. And that, of course, was not ideal because we ended up uh, with a beta release that in the beginning was much too complicated for non-technical audiences to start testing. Um, but this is something that maybe will happen also to other people. You know, if you start thinking about new audiences, for example, I mean, take into consideration the fact that they are very different from your typical audiences and that 
you have to really have this kind of like iteration with them and get feedback from them. So really correctly identifying the audience was something that we started doing this year. We had a product owner that really de devoted two entire months just to do that. Um, and it was very enriching and it's now like the way that we're developing the application right now, it's really, really drawn on that work that has been done. Um, going back to the language barrier, so Patricio talked about the difficulties that non-technical people can have with technical jargon. Um, one additional barrier uh, that we see a lot and that probably you Wikimedians don't see that much as languages, you're very good with that. Uh, we are maybe less, less, less good with that. So going beyond English a little bit, um, that's definitely something that it's on our roadmap as well. And then something else um, that maybe Patricio will uh, like to say a few words about is also like, when you start developing an application, the, complica the um, complication, do you say that in English? The complexity, basically, that you encounter with all the libraries that you need to use. I don't know if Patricio. Yeah, basically, um, we are a non-profit, so we don't have the budget of like a big software firm to build an application. Um, so the tools that we need to use to build these kind of applications is a tool that are more suitable for like enterprise applications, and maybe they are more expensive to run for like small teams. Um, and also we want like this, uh, um, this application to thrive um, and there are like two main ways to do it. Like, okay, we are going to develop in the future like a plugin ecosystem so people can like apply to it. But also if we want to uh, open source to be sustainable, you need to develop an application that is easy to understand. So other developers that jump into the code base um, can like uh, easily understand and collaborate. Because if you make like a monster that no one's understand, then no one collaborates and, and that's a tricky. So we are also, and it's, it's, a, it's a, meta pro, a, me, a meta problem in which like we want to develop something that also can be from the technical perspective, like uh, easy to understand and to collaborate. And the tech that we want to build is something that people can like maintain in the future that they don't need to have like three, 200,000 develop uh, year salary developers to, apply, to to implement because we don't have the money. So how can with low, a low budget organization develop an application with tools that are more suitable for like large enterprise um, companies? Can, can I ask a question real quick about when you say language can be a barrier, do you mean um, in the user interface, like simply translating across multiple languages or do you mean in the data manipulation itself, you mean in the? No, we need we we uh, mean literally in the UI. Um, so saying like a user, no, this column is not an integer, I, or this data is valid. What does it mean valid? Uh, and so because we're aiming this for like journalists, for like this person that works in the local municipality of my city. I doesn't know a thing. So that language is like extremely difficult to translate. And uh, as she said, like our product owner did like a massive work on that because she went to like communities that were like not technical at all. And then we have this massive bunch of feedback saying, we don't understand what are you doing? And we say, okay, we need to get back a little bit and simplify this because like the, the, the audience we are targeting is not understanding our language. I have, a, I have a question because I see uh, a little discrepancies in the sense that, uh, as you said, you are targeting a, a public that maybe is not so, uh, uh, sorry, is, is so educated in understanding the, the data management and so on. But among the way that you wish to have as output is uh, loading data in Wikidata. Uh, that may be a really a challenging step for someone that has not that big knowledge. So it may create more um, confusion than benefits. I understand that the, the, the good that is behind this tool for people that is not experienced to create a, a valuable data set, but then for the part which is the Wikidata, maybe should be someone else that should deal with. I think, and then Patricio can probably complete, the idea is to start really from that, but then having also an add-on for maybe more advanced um, users as well. I mean, if you think about it, we also have like plugins for GitHub, which is not, you know, I mean, maybe super accessible for non-technical audiences either, but we think that eventually this will also become something that is used by other people as well. Yes, um, and also um, there are like two, two targets. Like the first one is like basic users that want just like a validation. And second one is like a little bit more advanced that want to like go one step forward. 
And, and also in between, we had like a meeting with how is this foundation of like the German one? Um, and they say, hey, we want to, to, to have like an application like this, but in, in which we can control the the and pre-configure like the publishing processes for like that audience. So in a way, that, okay, we, we set the application in a way that then for them it's just like a publish because we as a more advanced users like did all the background job and they just go validate, click publish and they just, it's transparent for them. But because some technical user can configure, did the configuration behind. So that's another use case. I mean, this is like a super beta, um, uh, but we are exploring all these possibilities on how to, Okay, and also like thinking back again in the audience of like this small person in, in the municipality of my city, I want her to be able to like do the extra mile because she cannot go to the IT to say, okay, publish this. So how can we like also like close the gap in, 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 those, in those audiences? Okay, and with this, I'm sorry, but I need to run to the other panel. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, go ahead, go ahead. And maybe something else that I wanted to add to what Patricio just said is like, let's not forget also that one of the main points of like open data is also collaboration. And so, I mean, the idea of having different level of audiences that can collaborate on a tool like this, it's also the idea, let's say. So we will have time for more questions, but I wanted to ask you questions first. Um, basically, I wanted to know, I wanted to have a little bit of feedback here. Um, and basically, I wanted to ask you if from what you've seen right now, and of course, it's not a lot, uh, you haven't tried it yourself, but if you could uh, maybe tell me a little bit if you would use an application like this, for example, can you imagine the use of it in your data workflow or maybe not? Uh, if yes, how exactly? Um, if you can tell me maybe the most useful part for you, um, if you could fix a specific problem that you have, that would be very, very useful. Um, and if there's something that is missing. And I see that someone already wants to say something. Well, I don't know if it's missing, but I'm curious if a data set makes use of an outside classification, like a number from one to a thousand representing an area or an industry or an occupation that is documented elsewhere, how is that recorded here? Sorry, can you repeat the question with the microphone? I, I didn't hear it. If the data set uses an outside classification, like a number from one to 500 that represents something from a list, how is that recorded in here? Um, I think that would be, um, Patricia would be a better person to uh, reply to you, uh, but um, in that sense, you can think about, um, so the data description, uh, that comes into the data package, for example, that allows you to, uh, for example, if you have um, something that is already decided by an outside institution, for example, that would be a place where you can insert all those requirements, for example. Um, I don't know if this answers your question. Um, you mean like a unique identifier, right? Like a customized unique identifier for a thing. How would you translate it? and then publish it? Is that part of what you were asking? Or a standardized industry code. Or a standardized industry code coming from a government list, yeah, okay. Um, I just wanted to make sure I understood your question. Thank you. I, I have a different question though. <laughs> um, this feels very much like open refine. Is that, can you just, can you just talk about the, what, any differentiators between what you're working towards and what open refine offers? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so it feels in a way very similar, but I think that we are looking at a different audience compared to Open Refine, in the sense that this, at least in this first phase that we are doing right now, is really aimed at people that have like zero technical uh, skills and that would be um, intimidated by a tool like Open Refine, which is more like maybe medium skilled uh, audiences. So in that sense, that's different. And maybe the other difference um, with Open Refine, with whom we had collaborations in the past, actually, at the moment they had like frictionless data package as one of the export way of containerizing data. Um, but yeah, the, the different thing is maybe that the um, that we have the frictionless standards that are really the core of it. So this containerized way, uh, th this way to package data, which is very unique to frictionless, um, would maybe may be, be a difference. And to go back to your question, um, that's definitely, so you have a data package can be extended. So it means that, for example, you will have default uh, fields that you have to put there, but you can add also other stuff as well in there. So for example, if you have specific things to, that are specific to an industry, or you have, I mean, 
this is mostly for tabular data, but you have, if you have other kind of data, there is a way to extend that as well to accommodate other requirements. Uh, I was wondering, so uh, is this an app you always have to install locally or is it something you can install as a web app like Etherpad that multiple people can, uh, can use online? So thank you for this question. Uh, I was hoping that someone would ask. Um, so one thing that I did not mention, that we did not mention in this presentation, is that uh, this is basically not our first attempt at doing a UI application for frictionless data, um, and the first attempt was actually a cloud-based application. Uh, but what we saw uh, in that iteration that happened around 2018, if I'm not wrong, is that a lot of people were skeptical about having a cloud application because they were concerned for the data privacy. And um, for us, it was a bit of a nightmare in terms of hosting as well. And um, so when we started working on Open Data Editor, we, we knew right from the beginning that what we wanted to do was a desktop application that you can use actually also offline if you want to make sure that everything is really kept locally. Yeah, I, I would say the use case is different than Open Refine because as I understand it, what is happening in the Open Data Editor is that very distinct data packages are being published somewhere. And these are kind of immutable in the sense that they, they are standardized, they are packaged like, you know, a bowl, uh, I don't know, uh, a pot of, of uh, pickles, let's, let's say it like that, with a standardized label on it. And if you look at then at the process of using OpenRefine to add the data to Wikidata, it's basically opening up the pot and taking out a few pickles, only taking those pickles that are good for the recipe and then putting them in a big pot, which is Wikidata, and making sure that it fits the recipe, that it fits the community measures. So I think there are different processes there, and the, the things that people do in, in OpenRefine are also really much more granular, the data editing, the data modification, on, indeed, as you say, in a much more specialized way. I think, um, yeah, so I think both tools serve a different use case, I would say. Um, I'm not saying that uh, you cannot support Wikidata, but I think it's 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 going to be a big step if you want if your ambition is to support Wikidata. It's not going to be take your data set and boom, you can do do put it in Wikidata. It's going to be really like okay, there, there's going to be the complexity of how how are things described on on Wikidata? Is all the data valid for Wikidata? Is all the data accepted in Wikidata? Uh, it's what is already there, so you will have to match what is already in Wikidata, things like that. So. It's 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 less publishing a, a bucket of data in in a repository. It's much more integrating it in a larger whole and linked data, etc. So th those are things to to consider whether it, that's that's the way you want to go with the tool. I, I would welcome it, but I think it's it's different from what you're doing now. Yeah, absolutely. And thanks for this. Actually, I mean we're very in a preliminary stage. End. Sorry, two minutes. Okay, so go ahead with your question. I won't answer. <laughs> Hey, do you also take feedback and not just questions? All right, okay. So I think that this is a cool tool. And like you, you said you wanted it to have, um, to be used by audiences who have like no technical skill. I think that maybe some audiences that work with Excel or like data in, in, in tables, tabular data they already have some some technical skill and maybe it's cool that you're trying it with with journalists and maybe you wanted to have or maybe you have that already this could be my question specific use cases for that because I think when you compared it to yeah a small NGO doesn't have the same means as a big software company what the software companies do really well are like big big marketing to have a specific target group and identify a specific problem and i think that could be the key to find your niche for the product yeah absolutely and i mean when in my previous slide i was saying that identify your audience was one of the main takeaways that we had was that in, in the beginning we really sort of like aimed at everyone and then quite quickly we understood that people with non-technical skills are not the same and don't have the same profile. So at the moment for this uh, first iteration, we are really concentrating and focusing on journalistic communities. Um, but 
because I mean of our history at Open Knowledge Foundation, I would say that probably the next iteration would really be like public administrations that are publishers of data but don't always have the means of, you know, I mean, doing that in a, in, you know, I mean, publishing fair data and don't have always the concept to do that in an open and qualitative way. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> Um, there's 45 seconds if someone has a very last feedback <laughs> or question. One minute. <laughs> Thanks. Um, so reading the tagline, it says, um, no code application to explore and publish all kinds of data, data sets, tables, charts, maps, stories, and more. Uh, what do you want this uh, application to do? Yeah, so that was uh, from the beta release, let's say, when let's say that our audience identification was quite optimistic and overarching. So we narrowed it now a little bit. And so for the first iteration, what we really want to concentrate upon is data validation for people that don't have technical skills. And by doing that data validation, we hope that also like to maybe teach is maybe a big concept, but like really pass on some concepts also of like data quality and data fairness, um, and then data publication. Yeah, it's finished. Uh, thank you very much. And if ever you find me around and you have new feedback that you want to give me, please uh, go ahead. And the last thing that I wanted to say, please get in touch. Uh, those are our email address. If you have additional feedback, we would really be happy to hear it. Thank you again.